instead of viewing homemaking and rearing children as a precious gift from God, they view it as degrading, demeaning, and insulting. That's so far beneath me. I'm, I'm well above that. I could be a career woman. I'm going to university. I'm going to medical school. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer, and so on and so forth. See, ladies, you can be capable of all these things, but that doesn't mean that God wants you to be those things. Women these days look at homemakers as uneducated, they look at them as unintelligent dunces who are completely dependent on their husbands. I would like us now to, uh, to turn in the scriptures to Proverbs 31, and we will be reading the whole proverb. Proverbs 31, Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, and allow me to go there as well. <clears throat> Oops. Proverbs 31. All right. Proverbs 31, are we all there? All right. Does anyone, does everyone have a Bible here, visitors? Does anyone need a Bible that the... Do they all have Bibles? Okay. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for strong, or for princes to strong drink lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the, aff of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that, have, that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to de destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth the girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in the time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up, er, rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks for the blessing of thy word, Lord. And I pray for unction the preacher today. And I pray, Lord, it be a blessing to thy people, Lord. I pray, Lord, that would take heed. And even though it is a message largely geared to the ladies, Lord, there are principles here, as always, that the men 
can extract, Lord, and apply to their own lives. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Amen. So finally we've come to the seventh characteristic. Really, the, although there are many more that we could come up with, uh, we have seven that I've chosen to go through. We've finally arrived at the seventh, which is a godly mother is a virtuous mother, as you can tell from our text here. Now, once again, the recap, as I've done in previous uh, messages in this series, the other six characteristics are as follows. The godly mother, or a godly mother, is a generous mother. And for that, we looked at the Shunammitess, the Shunammite woman. And, and you're right now in your Bible reading, 2 Kings. And when you get to chapter 4, verses 8 through 37, you will be dealing, dealing with the Shunammite woman. She was a generous mother. And again... She was the only woman that called her, that God called her what? And I want them to know, I want the men to answer this. Gentlemen, great, great. great woman, yes, yes. And gentlemen, she's a great woman, great woman. A godly mother is a generous mother, and she was called a great woman by God. Yet God saw fit, the Holy Spirit saw fit to not name her. Obviously she had a name, but to God it was nothing to be considered. Yet he calls her a great woman. She was a generous mother, woman. She was a godly woman. She was a spiritually minded woman. For she, she immediately had concern for the needs of, a, of the man of God. She was perceptive to the man of God. She knew when the man of God was near in her home. And she constrained him to eat bread, the Bible says. So therefore she was hospitable. She was hospitable. She even, pro she even provided a chamber within her house where he had a bed to lie on, he had a candle, he had a desk to study, to meditate, uh, to, 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 to conduct his personal devotions. She made sure that the man of God's physical needs, <coughs> in other words, that he was well fed and his spiritual needs were taken care of. And that he always had a place to stay when he was in town. This was a, hospital, a, a generous, hospitable woman. And by the way, all of us here are called to be hospitable. Now I understand some of us here live in small apartments and that and it becomes very difficult and we're limited with space, but we're called to be hospitable. This is why my wife and I like to invite the church over every so often and have a meal together in a time of fellowship. Absolutely. So the God, a godly mother is a, gener a generous mother. Again, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse, verses 8 through 37. This is the Shunammites. A godly mother is a praying mother, a woman who is in direct communion with God. And the, and the example from Scripture that we, that, we, that we looked upon was Hannah in 1 Kings chapter 1 and 2. Hannah was a praying mother. She was much more than that, but she was a praying mother. And it was quite, am it was quite amazing because in chapter 2 you have her you have another prayer of praise, really, after she had given her, dedicated and given her child to the Lord to serve God, and therefore she wasn't to see his, her son that often, maybe, maybe once a year or so, but she was not to see her son after that, yet she praised the Lord. Many women would weep. A godly mother is a praying mother. A godly mother is a God-fearing mother. Jochebed, Moses' mother. A godly mother is a submissive mother. A mother who has surrendered and submitted to the will of the Lord. And this was Mary, the mother of Jesus. A godly mother is a teaching mother. My wife teaches. I work full-time. I'm out of the home. She, she homeschools the children. And although it is my, my responsibility to teach the Bible as much as I can, my wife is a teaching mother, and God has blessed her in that sense. And ladies, don't think that you cannot be a teaching mother. I'm looking now at Baby Lynn. If God blesses you with children, you can be a teaching mom, a mother. Don't worry about your, uh, your English and so on and so forth. God is going to give you the grace to overcome that. And, and, and you can be that teaching mother that God has called you to be. A godly mother is a righteous mother. By the way, you have help in the church. Mrs. Lamore and there are other ladies here that can help you. A godly mother is a righteous mother. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And of course, we're not talking about self-righteousness here. If you're self-righteous, you're not righteous. 
the righteousness that we possess as believers, as born-again Christians. And by the way, I trust those of you visiting, that I'm going to ask you this question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you been born again? Have you repented and believed and received the gospel of grace? How that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Yes, He died for your sins. And He rose again from the grave. He's not in that tomb. You can go to Jerusalem right now. He's not there, for He has risen on the third day. And He's now situated at the right hand of God, God Almighty. You know, we preach to the lost. We preach to the, to the Muslims. And I said, you know what? You know, your prophet is dead and buried in Mecca and his bones and flesh have been rotting for 1600 years 1500 years but my prophet who is God Almighty in flesh he was a prophet priest and king he rose but how 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 can God die how, do, how God, if he's God how can God die well God didn't die but the man Christ Jesus died Jesus God Almighty in flesh Jesus in his humanity died but he defeated death because he arose. There's no other belief on this planet, on this, on this earth, that can hold to that, that can claim that. So do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you don't, today's the day. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Now! I don't believe it's an accident that you walked in through this, these doors. You know why? Because God wants you here. He wants to hear the Word of God. He wants you to hear the Gospel. If you don't know Him, He wants you to hear it today. None of us here are righteous outside of Jesus Christ. The righteousness that I possess is of Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. I can safely say through the new birth that I am clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That was purchased for me on Calvary's cross through His shed blood. Elizabeth was righteous before God and man. And that righteousness produced John the Baptist. That godliness produced John the Baptist. That steadfastness in the faith produced John the Baptist. Don't think God can't use your children. He can. So this brings us to the seventh characteristic. A godly mother is a virtuous mother. Now, the word virtuous here in Webster's 1828 defines it as thus. It defines it as moral goodness or as a moral goodness. And this is what it says. Morally good, acting in conformity to moral law, practicing the moral duties, and abstaining from vice as a virtuous man, or you could say a virtuous woman. Being in conformity to the moral or divine law as a virtuous action, a virtuous life. And thirdly, chaste applied to women. Chaste women. That's the goal for ladies. The world says something else. Now I'd like to draw your attention now to verse 10. And here a question is asked and it says, Who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find her? Indeed. It would seem to God that he, it were a rare thing for a woman to be virtuous based on this question posed. Who can find her? And you know what? It is a rare thing in these days. Indeed. We live in a society where women are anything but virtuous. Even in our churches. Yeah. When you read through the entirety of Proverbs 31, most Christian women fall short of the virtuous woman's standard. Ladies, look in the mirror. Do you meet those standards? And I firmly believe that almost two centuries of feminist ideology that has subtly crept into our churches has heavily contributed to this. Again, I've mentioned it's in our church. Not to the extent that it's in the world. I understand that. This is why, ladies, I want you to literally look in the mirror. Analyze where you are out of order. And then study the Word of God and see in light of what the Word of God teaches a biblical woman ought to be, or teaches about biblical womanhood, if you will. What does it teach? What does it say? Am I out of line? 
Am I crossing that line? Am I on my way to be move, moving further to the left? See, God wants you over here. Are you shifting over this way? And of course, I'm not abrogating men from their duties. I find often feminism is justified because men are weak. Men have been effeminated, and maybe that was also the anti-Christ uh, Christ, satanic fruit of feminism, and that men have been effeminated. I see this when I'm out in public, and it's clear as day. Young men, middle-aged men, civil authorities have been effeminated, double-minded. That's what happens. When a man has been effeminated, he becomes double-minded. He can no longer lead and take charge. You see, most women, including many Christian women, are too selfish these days. Rather than being the help me to their husband that God has created them to be, they want to rule over their husband instead. By the way, I believe that's Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. I desire to be, is to thy husband. See, women, it, you know, for a woman to submit to her husband does not come naturally. It doesn't. It really takes the grace of God. And uh, really, when I look at my children, if you will, yell, I have to teach her to tone it down. You know, I've got to teach her to, to keep things in line so that she will one day possess that ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Whereas the boys, I have to draw out that boldness. That boldness, that take charge attitude. You almost, you have to draw that out. You have to teach them to be that. Otherwise, they will not be that. And sometimes they get concerned. Instead of viewing homemaking and rearing children as a precious gift from God, they view it as degrading, demeaning, and insulting. That's so far beneath me. I'm, I'm well above that. I could be a career woman. I'm going to university. I'm going to medical school. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer, and so on and so forth. Homemaker? See, ladies, you can be capable of all these things, but that doesn't mean that God wants you to be those things. No. Women these days look at homemakers as uneducated. They look at them as unintelligent dunces who are completely dependent on their husbands. Yep. Let me move out here. Feminism has effectively masculinized women and effeminated men. I want to repeat that. Feminism has effectively masculinized men and effem or women rather and effeminated men. Amen. You see this in real time when you minister out there in public. You got women, loud mouth, clamorous women confronting the preaching, and they're taken aback once they're when they, when they get the when they get it right back in their face. You need, you need to. Shut, you know, shut up, and they'll use worse, worse language than shut up. Obviously, they're going to add to that, and you guys know. Uh, you need to get away from here. You need to keep quiet. Of course, when they're called out for being a Jezebel, loudmouth Jezebel, they don't like it. Oh, you're a misogynist. What a misogynist. You're such a... Now you hate women, too? <laughs> you like the voice, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's true that you actually say that. No, I don't hate women. As Dr. Lamar used to say, I'm married to one. <laughs> and he had three daughters too. I think you can use the same voice for everyone. <laughs> exactly, the same effeminate voice. No, I don't hate women. You know, just as the men ought to do what, they ought, what they're called to do, and ordain to do and, and fulfill their ordained roles in the light of God. And that's really headship. That's taking charge. That's toiling. That's providing for their own household. Uh, that's loving their wives, self-sacrificially, uh, protecting her, desiring to protect her. You know, um, 
And when I was just thinking about this on the drive down, because you did that PP bliss, remember that little? I thought about him. And I thought, you know, husbands, love your wives, even as Jesus Christ loved the church. And I thought about it for a moment while I was driving. I didn't discuss this with you, but I was thinking about it. Um, um, you know, it's a self-sacrificial love. By the way, we preach that to the Muslims because they teach that you can beat your wife in Arabic, straight out. Uh, uh, in chapter 4, verse 34 of their book, it tells you, if she's not, if she's not obedient, beat her. And of course, the English translations soften that up a little bit. You know, lightly if it is useful. And some say just, just correct her gently. They even really soften it to the point where you just correct her gently. Uh, no, it's actually the Arabic says beat her. This is why you go to Saudi Arabia. It's not uncommon to see a Muslim wife with bruises on her, you know, black and blue, black eye and so on and so forth. Because, you know what, she was probably disobedient to her husband. So therefore he just like laid it into her. <laughs> exactly. It's really... No... That's not, my, my Bible says, yeah, women are to submit to their husbands, wives are to, but my Bible says, husbands, love your wives. And it tells you exactly the parameters of that love as Jesus Christ loved the church and also gave himself for it. And that is perfect love. No husband can ever measure up to that kind of love. We fall way well short, but at least we have a standard that we seek, we strive to meet, even though we fall short. And that love is self-sacrificial. That love is literally a love that's willing to lay down his life for his wife, protector, nourisher, you name it. And that got me to thinking about P.P. Bliss there. You know, in the fire. You know, he got out alive. And he went back in to rescue his wife and perished with her. That's the love of Christ and the man. That's the love that the Bible's talking about. Islam won't offer that, by the way. I know I'm, I'm, I'm in Islam because we've dealt with it recently, but it won't offer that. And not that any of you here have a problem with Islam uh, in, in your own lives, where you're, you're seeking, you know what, I want to lay down my devotions here. I'm just going to get my Quran out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, today I'm going to read the Quran. I know Mrs. Lamore read the Quran. How, how was that experience? <laughs> I, this, it doesn't make sense. I read through that. It's incomprehensible gibberish is what it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it is sickening. I bet you your spirits lift up and you're just, you were just growing. <laughs> I guess you were moved. Wow. See, feminism has effectively masculinized women and effeminated men. This paradigm shift has been a gradual process over the last six decades and has resulted in the redefining of gender roles. Most women nowadays cringe at the thought of being completely dependent on a loving husband who will work his tail off to provide for his household. They want their own bank accounts and their own careers. My wife and I have a shared bank account. In fact, she really wants nothing to do with the finances. They've been conditioned to believe that they are capable of doing anything that a man can do. Well, you know what? Anything a man can do, I can do it even better. All right. Get on that crane. You know, David works over at the Sobeys um, at the, the depot there out in Whippy. What is the weight that they require? Is it 50 kilos or something that they have to lift? Uh, yeah, probably about like 80 pounds. 80 pounds. Okay, ladies, you want to you, you wanna, you wanna volunteer? You want to work at Sobeys? You have to lift. Uh, at the depot, you have to lift 80 pounds. It's a, that's, that's a condition of employment. 80 pounds. I, anything I could do, anything a man could do, I could do. Okay, try to do that all day. No, you can't. And conversely, a man can't do what a woman can do. I can't do what my wife does. The multitasking. My wife, she's keeper at home. And that's work, by the way. That's work. That's right. And by the way, the rewards are heavenly. Amen. Think the rewards are heavenly. Homeschooling, six children. While taking, like literally doing long, you name it, just guiding the home, everything. Think you can do that, Andrew? No. That's why, you, that's why God gave you a wife, because you can't do it. Well, you probably could do 
to a degree, but it's going to be a lousy job, right? Let's face it. <laughs> anything, they've been conditioned to believe that anything, that they are capable of doing anything a man can do, but this claim is fallacious because in reality, they can't, can't do what a man can do and vice versa. How many women do you see building high rises, building highways and houses? How many? What percentage? That's right, very few. They want equal pay? Well, you get equal pay for the equal job. We're not here to demean women. Feminism demeans you, ladies. Feminism has taken away your God-given femininity. Fact is, men and women are not equal. Both men and women have been assigned distinct roles that when fulfilled will inadvertently bring glory to God. Again, I can't do what my wife does. No. And she can't do what I do. But we complement each other. And that's the way it ought to be. And that's how God designed it. Now I want to quote here from Lori Alexander's blog, AKA she goes by the moniker, the transform wife. And I don't agree with everything she says. I just want to make that, that clear here, but there's certainly things that she, she, she's very strong on and she's very strong on biblical womanhood. And she's made that her ministry. Although me personally, I tend to believe that uh, should be within the local church and it's been perfect fulfillment. But nevertheless, there is good things that she does right. And you have to exercise discernment. And this is from a, from a particular piece that she had written titled, Has God Called Women to Be Independent? Independent. I'm an independent woman. See, it's frowned upon. But actually, God has created women to be dependent on good, godly husbands. Again, men, you've dropped the ball. You've dropped the ball. See, I'm not, I'm not absolving men of their duty. You've dropped the ball. And as Christian men, we have a tall order. Corey, who loves the ways of the Lord, wrote a comment on my Facebook page. She says, supporting a post I'd written. Then, quote, Lauren responded to her comment this way. And this is what she says. Yes, I'd love to be able to rely on a man and not contribute to make or make my own money to feel independent. Corey then asked the women in that chat room, quote, why the need for independence? To be independent from your husband is to, be, is to go against God. Even the connotation of independence seems to be in rebellion of the Bible. It's like you're saying you need, no one in, you need no one in life, not even Christ. That's what it's saying. A woman wrote to me, she says here the other day, and told me she was proud of raising three independent daughters who will be able to take care of themselves financially, therefore not be in need of husbands. Ooh, that is, if that's a Christian woman, satanic. Is this a good thing and something to be proud about? Is this how God requires that we raise our daughters? And can any of you find Bible verses that commands we do this? This ought to be your first reference point. Your point of reference right here. What does the Bible say on the matter? You know, I'm becoming more and more narrow with each passing day on this issue. I am. I am. Because I could see that little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And that process of gradualism, a.k.a. the Hegelian dialectic, is very subtle. That paradigm shift, and by the way, anything outside of the Exodus chapter 32 and verse 26 paradigm, who is on the Lord's side, you're either on the Lord's side or you're on Satan's side. Anything outside of that, any other paradigm is a satanic construct. Even left and right politics is a satanic construct. You name it, you have all kinds of paradigms. If we keep that in mind, uh, you, you, you do well. There's only one paradigm. And of course, we can bring this into the theological area, area too as well, right? Fundamentalism versus mo uh, modernism and so on and so forth. And again, you get this paradigm shift with, which effectively results in compromise away from the truth. This is why churches are a mess. This is why our, even our independent Baptist churches who are armed with the truth, armed with the Baptist distinctives, although now I'm firmly 
in the belief that they've dropped the S, the final S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they don't even realize it. Yeah. And, and thus making themselves Protestant, which thus making themselves again Roman Catholic. Yeah. State church. No. So here it goes. Here are the responses to Corey's comment from the wise women in the chat room. Here, Paige says this, It is definitely rebellion, and sadly it is due, to par due in part to our individualistic society. I agree with her here. Everything is about self, whereas in other cultures, the emphasis is the family unit. Mom, dad, grandparents, extended family. We live in a self-centered society. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Helen says this, Women today hate to feel dependent on anyone. They want to make their own money so that they don't feel beholden to anyone or have to rely on anyone for their bed and board. I don't need no man! Again, men need to step up to the plate. Christian men, keep that in mind. We have a tall order. Molly says this, I just thought about you know who. That's wrong. That's, that's inverted. That's a Satan, that's a satanic home. Satan's the head of that home, not Christ. You know what you know who I'm mentioning as well, who I'm talking about there. I don't care. And I understand you've got health issues, but you can work in some capacity. And if you take care of yourself and you're sensitive, uh, you know, there is to be some blame if you allow your blood sugar to get so low. Because you've been if you're a type 1 diabetic, you've been long enough, you've been that long enough. To understand when you're just not feeling right and some of you that are type 2 you know when your blood sugar is low you better be prepared have something on you that will quickly give you that boost by the way if you're type 2 that can be curable it'll take a lot of uh, discipline but it can be cured a lot of dietary discipline exercise involved in that as well Molly says yes we are to be dependent on our husbands who are to be our heads it is a safe and fulfilling place to be. However, it goes against what girls are taught today. <clears throat> Lori is, is counter-cultural because she teaches that we are to be respectful to our husband's calling and role. That's what Lindsay says. It's silly to claim that a woman staying at home and caring for her husband and children is not contributing. They're assuming these things don't count and only make money, and only making money is a contribution. They count. What my wife does in the home has, has eternal value and there will be eternal rewards for her. Absolutely. This is what we forget to, we fail to realize. And God has provided for our needs. I don't make a lot of money, folks. I really don't. Yet God has provided. Yet I don't strive to, I don't, I don't strive to be rich. I don't labor to be rich. Yet yeah, caring for the home and children is a huge contribution. Someone has to care for these things. And if the couple doesn't do them, they have to pay someone else to do them. A nanny, daycare. Plus, no one is going to care and love your children like, like their own mother. No one is going to love and care for your children like their own mother. You think these daycare workers love those children like their mother does or should? Should? Because you know what? The reason why I say that, their mothers don't love them. Their fathers don't love them. <clears throat> you might need to downsize to make things work you might need to get rid of some things some creature comforts you might have to live in a little bit of discomfort to do what pleases God When a, when, a, when a woman stays home, she says that she is dependent on her husband financially. But, she is, but he is dependent on her to care for the home and children. See? It's a trade-off. We need both sexes. You know what? If God didn't, feel the, didn't uh, de, uh, see the need for, to create a helpmeet, if you will, for Adam, then he wouldn't have created the woman. She's created to be his help meet. That's God's plan. And together they are one flesh and they complement each other. It's Bible. See, this is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. 
a couple needs to depend on one another. Amen? If they are doing that, why in the world are they married? Or if they aren't doing that, rather, why in the world are, are they married? That's what Katie says. It stems from lack of trust. Also, so many of us have divorced parents or absent fathers. That's indicative of our society today. So because we couldn't rely on our fathers for one reason or another, we mistrust men in general. Before I was saved, I had the same mistrust. I put all my effort into becoming financially independent, so I didn't need to rely on a man. I achieved my goal, but it felt so empty. I look at women in my work. I look at even our warehouse manager, gain the world, gain the world, but I'm wondering how fulfilled she is. How fulfilled. No children, by the way. Well, I don't think you could be a warehouse manager, really. And, and, I mean, children would be a hindrance to that. Reversed. That's what Taylor says. If I'm not contributing, I want to know why I'm so tired. Jessica says, my stepdaughter just said the same type of th same thing, or same type of thing. I'm sure her mother has drilled into her to never trust a man. You can't depend on someone. Society shoves it down everybody's throat too. We live in a sad world. So what Rachel says, while growing up, it was drilled in my head that one should not depend upon a man. One should get a degree, and a man shouldn't want to have a woman who was lazy. And where we live in California, even health and human services drilled messages through ads at the movie theater to teenagers that families need two incomes. Now, with inflation, you're almost there. But had we obeyed God, you wouldn't have what you have now. I believe had we obeyed God, you wouldn't have the inflation you have. Had we obeyed God, men would be making more money. Uh, therefore, they could take care of their family on that one income. Had we obeyed God, all of this would have been given to us. <clears throat> See, when you disobey God, God takes it away. That's why we need two incomes. But even... In the midst of all that, God will provide if you, if you seek and desire to do things God's way. Now I understand, if you had a couple walk in here where both are working, and one quit their job immediately, and then they wouldn't be able to pay the bills, well, you know what? Pray for God to work that out. And to give you the measure of faith required to make that next important step. Says likewise, growing up with a divorce rate of 50%, watching everyone's parents getting divorced, it reinforces that message. Having the personal experience of losing my dad as a teenager to a heart attack, two friends in high school lost their dads to heart attack and aneurysm, then friends in college lost their dads to suicide, two different friends. There's a lot of reasons why people do what they do and why they have trouble trusting God. Some ideas are so ingrained into your consciousness it takes God faith, and a whole lot of courage to go against an upbringing and experience. Likewise, I, as, I, <clears throat> I also have the added perspective, this, this is why I'm reading what is written, by the way, of the life we are living. Not easy, but doable. And God has blessed us with all that we need. Truly amazing, she says. I hope all women with the desire to have good, loving husbands who support them and the desire to have children may be so blessed by God and I hope God may supply all their needs too. All their needs too. By the way, for those that are single here, men included, be patient. And don't discount the fact for the men that God can bring her right through these doors. Be open to that. And you know, I, 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 I firmly contend, if you desire it, beg him for it. Beg him for it. What's the word I'm thinking about there? Uh, with much importunity, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. This is what Rachel says. I'm not sure this woman, Connie, feels so obviously defensive 
It would be hard to go through life distrust sorry, go through life distrustful in a marriage, feeling like one's contribution were directly tied to a monetary contribution, and that the option to stay at home and be happy in a traditional role was not a possibility. Either because the concept of marriage or trust in man is so broken, or having a feeling of poverty in one's life. What happens at the end of one's life when one is infirm and cannot work? Does their life become less meaningful or worthy of life? It's a deep and painful question to deal with. I wish her well and pray for her. This is what Brittany says. I'd be curious to know if this woman goes to work for a man. Does she not rely on her male manager to make decisions for her and tell her what to do? That's a good question, by the way. Most of these women that are in the workforce are serving another man. They're obeying another man. They're submitted to another man who's their boss. Amen. Continues on here. Where a stay-at-home mom makes many independent decisions daily for her family because her husband has entrusted her to do that. To me, the latter seems more independent. And you are actually. Because you're, with you're within the protective framework of God's will. That's what Helen says, not my sister. People are also, also mistakenly believe you're only contributing to the family if you bring hard cash into the coffers. The other contributions to the family, as Lindsay and others have talked about, are equally valuable. It's a sad day when only a paycheck equals contributed. Now, this comes from a forum that she was engaging with. Continues here. The decline of the family is the primary haven in a heartless world, the growth of individualism, and the retreat from community loyalty and dependence have made it increasingly difficult for anyone to achieve an adequate sense of belonging in a hostile, fragmented world. The Bible says, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. I'm going to actually now cut it off here today and make this a two-parter. So just someone, if you can mark it down, I'm on page eight. I've decided to, to make it a two-parter today. It's going a bit longer than what I anticipated. Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks for the blessing of thy word, Lord, of this message. Lord, I do pray for the ladies here, Lord, that they would, they would desire and seek thy grace to live as the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. Now, there are mothers here, grandmothers here, and great-grandmothers here. Many of them are past that age of childbearing, Lord, rearing, but they can be that virtuous woman. They can be that virtuous influence to the younger women. I pray for virtuous men in this church, Lord, godly men, strong men, warriors, Lord, of good soldiers of Jesus Christ, ready for the battlefield, Lord. That is the Christian life. Help us, Lord, to have thy mind on these things. Even help us to hold to the standards, Lord, on these things, Lord, of biblically-based standards. Even if we are hated of the world, who cares, Lord? We seek to live in accordance to what thy word has dictated, Lord, and may that be our desire. And where we are deficient, Lord, help us to, to conform to thy word, Lord, and, and where, we, where we are blind to certain things, Lord, I pray, Lord, illuminate these things to us and, and show us the way, Lord. Well, I believe all of us here have blind spots somewhere in our lives, Lord, and I pray, Father, make those known to us. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.